The title is How to Spend Lent Fruitfully uh, as a preparation for the most important Catholic holiday, which is Easter. And it's obviously the most important holiday in, uh, for a Catholic because Easter showed us how to open the, the door for uh, salvation. So in the beginning of Catholicism, it lasted for, from 40 to 70 days. So it differed uh, quite a lot. And because of that, we have names for the Masses before Lent, like Septuagesima, which means 70 days before uh, Easter, actually. Uh, just because the, the Lent would last like a very crazy long time. In the 6th century, uh, uh, however, Pope Gregory the Great established the Lenten times that we have uh, right now, which is the 40 days. And uh, I'll go back to that in a second. In the 4th century, uh, they, we could notice, uh, in like, that it was the time for new uh, Catholics that wanted to join the church get baptized. It usually happened on the vigil before Easter. Or it was for the people that publicly repented for their sins to go back to church and it was the time for them to end their penance, their public penance, and join the church again. And it wasn't the time for all fast, it, like the, the whole, whole Lent wasn't fasting. Because the funny thing is that it depended on the, the fasting that you did uh, before Lent. <laughs> so the more fasting you did before Lent, the less fasting you had to do during Lent. So sometimes it was a little bit of fasting for some regions. For some regions, it was the whole Lent was fasting. And before the 6th century, different places had different lengths of Lent. Uh, usually in the Western, Western Lent was shorter than Eastern. In the West, they had 36 days of Lent. And that's why we made it 40 by added extra 4 days. Therefore, we start Lent on Wednesday to make it even 40 days. And that's how Ash Wednesday actually started. It wasn't because of like any particular... Uh, other tradition than just adding the extra 40 days to the beginning of Lent to make it even 40 for obvious reasons to uh, uh, remember that Jesus went to the desert for 40 days and fasted there for 40 days. So, yeah, the church after, after the 6th century they even it out and that Wednesday wasn't an Ash Wednesday, Wednesday yet. It developed later. So most common Lenten practices, I think we... There are, there are different approaches to that. Uh, the most, of course, Lent, it always reminds us of asceticism. And asceticism is just giving up uh, pleasures and earthly desires for God to repent for our sins and grow in faith uh, just to also just stop from, like, stop our bodily pleasures from appearing. And we can do it by diff doing different uh, different things. The church recommends prayer, fasting, and charity, especially during, during Lent, all of those three. But I don't think that coffee and asceticism are uh, eye baths or giving up listening to music or giving up eating your favorite food or just something like that. And that's where the quote unquote resolution. And the problem with resolutions is that modern world, I think, made us kind of not think about them in a serious way. And we forget the, that making a resolution is making a promise to do something or not do something. And when we don't listen to it, we just kind of go, oh, it's not a deal. It's not a sin. I just kind of wanted to do it. It didn't work out. Well, whatever happens, you know. But the problem is if it's not, it's, it's a promise. So if it's not taken seriously, it is a sin. And it's a, it's not a moral sin, it's a venial sin, but still, it is, it is an offense. And we really should remember about that. So, especially during Lent or Advent, when we take up resolutions like, I'm not gonna eat candy because that's the most popular one, or I'm not gonna drink soda, or I'm not gonna whatever, do this or that, or I'm gonna pray more, you gotta do it. And if you don't do it, you should confess it. Because it's not, it's not a little thing to omit. It's very important to take these things really seriously.
And of course, we should be reasonable with our resolutions and the aesthetics that we want to take on uh, during Lent and make them into habits. So it's, it becomes our, it becomes something that makes us grow in our spiritual life and helps us grow in faith instead of just a little like, oh yeah, I'm just giving up candy for just, you know, so I lose weight. Because that's not the point of Lent. We are not supposed to lose weight during Lent. That's not why we fast. That's not why we don't eat candy. The resolution, the, the point of it is just to grow spiritually and be stronger in the faith and get further and further from the modern world. Fasting. I think that's the, it's going to be the longest one and the most, uh, I think the most praised way of going through Lent and should be very praised because it's very powerful. I'll just go over like a bunch of things, not accord, not really with the um, order I mentioned here. So fasting is uh, like it's abstain. It's not abstaining. Fasting is just not <laughs> not eating food. It's just you can fast doing like in you know, different ways. You can either have uh, a, like one bigger meal and two tiny meals or not eat at all. Jesus didn't eat at all. And that's the, the fast that we should really be doing. First Christians fasted every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. And they on Wednesday they fasted for Judas' betrayal. Just to remember Judas' betrayal and as a repentance for that, they fasted on Wednesday. I don't know why Wednesday, but they just they just did it that way. Friday was of course as a remembrance of uh, death of our Lord. And Saturday was uh, as a remembrance of putting him in the grave. And before, uh, as I mentioned as well, the more they fasted during those daily fasts throughout the year, the less they had to fast before Lent. So pre-Lenten uh, fast wasn't as severe. So in certain, certain regions, in 3rd century, for example, before Lent you had to fast for a whole week, or in other places you had to fast for two weeks, except uh, Sunday. So they wouldn't eat basically anything for for two weeks, or they would just eat like one meal before Lent even. Uh, and then after after that, uh, with with time, uh, Lenten fasting got stricter, and the weekly because of that, the weekly fast gradually disappeared, and now we celebrate it as I think it's called Dry Days. And it's, those are the three, the Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday of, I think, the last month in the quarter or something like that. I can't exactly remember. Fasting is, as I mentioned also, a form of an anesthetism, and it's been known for ages. It appeared even in the, it was appreciated by ancient civilizations as a way of pleasing their gods and hoping that they would forgive them their sins. So it's now in Catholicism, all of their religions praised uh, fasting before. Uh, Jews thought that fasting was an important part of any religious practice. Uh, that's why I think as Catholics, we should really focus on valuing fasting. Because as, I mean, at least from the sword book, there's a beautiful sentence that says that if you really want to be a true Catholic, participating in uh, the truth of the gospel and in the life of the church, you have to be fasting, otherwise you're a hypocrite. <laughs> fasting is a way of humiliating ourselves in front of God, uh, repenting for our sin. Uh, and if we add kneeling and prayer it's also to fasting, it just it's so powerful that it helps us control all, all of our earthly desires and it helps with casting our demons. That's something that we also are, I don't think we're reminded of very often that only with fasting and prayer we can cast out certain demons. And that's like the most powerful exorcism that we can perform on ourselves, really. <laughs> fasting is also a virtue of temperance. Uh, it helps us temper our bodily desires, all of our uh, immoderation, or any thoughts, really. Even if it's food or just any, really anything, it just helps us leveling the the emotions that are around us every day, around different things like arguments with people or 
yeah, just being a moderate really with anything. If, if it's clothing or food or games or whatever else we're struggling with, it really shows that if you're fasting and you're doing it well, you are capable of controlling your body very well. It's also, uh, it's also a penance for our sins. It adds up the value of our prayers and so makes them stronger and helps us with fighting against other temptations and also on the spiritual, uh, on the spiritual level, like with the mind, if we want to get. It makes you less, I feel like it makes you less angry and more like just, yeah, just leveled. <laughs> it just makes you leveled on, on different fields. So it's not only moderation with food, but also just when you talk to people, you feel calmer. It's also a sign of awaiting for the Lord to come back. Uh, it reminds us that he will come back, but before that we have to mourn his disappearance. And that's where the fasting appears around times when we are, uh, when we are out to remember our Lord's sacrifice and death. So that's why Fridays, that's why Lent, that's why Advent actually, because he is not appeared yet. Uh, and that's also what we said in the Bible that when you are, you have a feast while, uh, God is with you, but when he's gone, then that's the time to mourn and await his comeback. Um, also from the, the, just the health really point of view, <laughs> it's good for our bodies to fast. I mean, it cleanses up from cells that are just negative for, for our bodies and it cleanses up all the old residue and just helps with energizing overall. And the good thing that comes with fasting uh, is also that the food that you don't eat or money you don't spend on food, you can donate to charity as well, uh, which is another thing that church is calling us to do during uh, Lent is the fasting, charity, and prayer. So that's something to think about. If it comes to who should fast, abstinence from meat is for uh, people that are seven years old, uh, old or older. And then fasting for people 21 to 60 years old, abstinence applies on all Fridays except Good Friday and Dry Fast, which as I mentioned before, it's Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on the last quarter of the, uh, of the last month of the quarter. And then uh, we do fasting on Mondays to, uh, to Thursdays during Lent. And then abstinence and fasting on Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, Great Saturday, Dry Fast Day, Christmas Eve, Eve of Mary's Assumption, Eve of All Saints on Halloween, which is very surprising, actually, if you think about it, and Eve of Pentecost. I think this Halloween is really funny that we just go into our candy and we're supposed to abstain like, and fast and go to things. Um, all right, let's go to another one, which is charity. It's another important part of Lent uh, for all the Catholics. Really charitable person knows that charity is not only paying money to like some organization or just to church, but also it's helping others in many different ways. It's uh, doing good, doing good deeds really, uh, or praying for them, but not bragging about it. Just doing it out of out of love for them, out of pity and love that you have for them as for like other humans that you see are suffering. And also, you just want to share what you have to the people that don't have that thing. It's also good to be charitable and not, like, attached to anything that is of this world. So whether it's money or clothing or food or devices or books or whatever, it really can be anything if you think about that. Um, it's good to just give it to others, get rid of this. And even if you... And especially when it hurts you, when you're used to that thing and you want to keep it. When it hurts you to give that thing up, definitely give that up. Because that's what's holding you back from reaching heaven. And then, the, of course, the question would be, is everyone capable of doing acts of charity? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Because as I said, it's not only money. Like even a homeless person that does have nothing, they can pray for others. They can do... Uh, other like nice deeds for other people they can pick up trash from the streets that's act of charity uh they can open the door for someone it's 
Paths of charity are very broad, and we I think we forget that you can do just nice things and consider an act of charity. Like, yeah, giving food that you save from fasting to the poor people, or just money that you have for that food, or even helping an old lady cross the road. That's a very nice thing to do, and it's charitable. Uh, or paying for someone's groceries or holding the door to somebody. There's really, the examples are countless. So definitely during Lent, we should try to do more charity, not only money-wise, because we not always have money, but just the good deeds, really. Just think what that other person would need from me. Can I do something to brighten the other person's day? Can I maybe compliment them to, because they think that and to make their day better? Or can I just offer them a ride? Or can I give them a candy bar? Like, what can I do to make this person's day better because I love them and I want the best for them? Now, the last thing that church really calls us to do during Lent is prayer. And now, prayer is the... I feel like a lot of Catholics struggle with that because prayer requires preparation. We shouldn't just jump into prayer without previous preparation and without setting an environment for it. We shouldn't just like, you know, come whatever from whatever we are doing outside of prayer without any setting our mind to it, without any like putting ourselves in front of God. Uh, we just like throw ourselves in there and just start, oh yeah, I'm just going to like pray right now. We should, before we start saying words to God, we should really put our, like, calm ourselves down, put ourselves in the presence of God, and think, thank you God for everything you do for me. I'm really grateful. Uh, please listen to my prayer if you wish, and if it's nice, and if you, you, you desire to do so. And when you have, like, at least two minutes of that preparation, it can really change the way you're praying. The, the, like, the, even the focus you have on the prayer, it can really help out with that. And it will probably help out with all, overcoming the temptations during prayer that I bet everybody's struggling with. And usually it's just thinking about other things or just mumbling the words without thinking what you're saying. I think a rosary is definitely prayer like that because it's so monotonous and you don't really think about what you're saying and you start thinking about something else. So to overcome that, you just have to remind yourself every once in a while, oh, I'm praying the rosary right now. We're praying these mis mysteries. I'll try to think about those mysteries. And sometimes it doesn't, it's sometimes we can also ask God. He's like, I really struggle right now. I'm trying to pray. I can't do it. I can't pay attention. Please, Lord, help me. And then just try ourselves as well, obviously, without, because without that, it's just pointless. Just look at the cross. And then do the fidget with rosary beads. It really helps uh, to just find any, like, uh, technique that helps you with focusing your mind on what you're saying or even reading. I found that with, with me, at least, when I'm, when I'm reading during a uh, prayer, it really helps me set my mind on, onto the prayer. And obviously, it progresses with uh, with time, and you can get better. You use better techniques for it. But anything that helps you really with paying attention to what you're saying, is, it's really important to pray and have a point with it. Because prayer that is mumbling is pointless, because you're just mumbling words into the air. And if we if we stop praying, if we think, well, the temptations are too tough, I can't do it, I'm just not going to pray. I don't think it's, it makes any sense. Well, the problem is that if you stop praying, it's a first step to hell. And most souls that go to hell and were Catholic, they just went there. They fell because they stopped praying. As soon as somebody stops praying, they, they just reach, they, it just falls downhill from there. <laughs> they just, they just forget what to do as a Catholic and it first, it's first a prayer, which is talking to God. It's talking with God. It's telling him all of your problems and how grateful you are and all of the, yeah, it's just prayer is everything. Without prayer, we can't be, we can't be saved. And when you don't pray, you just, you're basically selling yourself, selling your soul to the devil. And as a, a way of fighting it, we can uh, participate in a way of the cross. 
which is a special Lenten service. And for Way of the Cross, it usually happens on all Fridays during Lent. And participation in it uh, equals uh, plenary indulgences. So for to, to do so, you have to fulfill the usual uh, things for plenary indulgence, like not being uh, used to an art, you know, like some, even the venial sin, or uh, having confession and Eucharist received days before or after. But also, you have to do it in front of the way of the cross pictures that has to uh, have 14 crosses. You have to meditate on passion and death of our Lord and has to go from station to station unless there are too many people in the church. And then uh, it counts still when only the celebrant does it. Uh, and then if you can't go to church during uh, it's a sickness or the, clo- the church is closed or you are traveling, uh, you can get plenary indulgence if you meditate faithfully on passion uh, and death of our Lord for at least 30 minutes. And obviously the ways of devotion are uh, different. The most popular one is uh, a church with people, with the congregation. Uh, but you can also do with a church alone. Or even at home, as a private devotion, any really way of practicing the way of the cross, I'm sure, grants us great graces from our Lord for remembering uh, his great sacrifice that he's done to us. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.